Shalom, and welcome to another edition of Parsha Talk. I'm Rabbi Elliot Malamet, Highland Park, New Jersey, the Highland Park Conservative Temple Congregation, Anshay Mena, and joining me, my good friends, Rabbi Jeremy Kalmanovsky, Anshay Chesed, New York City, Rabbi Barry Chesler, Solomon Schechter Day School of Long Island. It's great to see you. I feel like we're in like the countdown mode. It's uh, We're recording this uh, uh, in Elul. <laughs> the 11th of Elul. 12 Elul. Is it 12? It's 12 Elul today. Oh, it's the 12th. Oh, my God. I even have one less day. Yeah, really. It's And so we don't even want to talk about it. But what we do want to talk about is this amazing Parsha, Kitavo. This, um, we we are reaching the end. We're reaching the end of the Torah. And we are uh, going to take care of some material here at the beginning of this Parsha. Basically, the beginning of the Parsha talks about a ceremony. It's the... It's the, the ceremony of the pilgrim to the temple. Really, it's the temple. It's not specified as the temple. It's the place that God chooses. And the pilgrim is placing in his basket the first fruits of the land. And the pilgrim makes a declaration. And here I'm going to t- t- turn it over to you, Barry. I know I know this is uh, there's some information here, and there's also some meaning to this. Um, he goes to the priest. I'll just set it up a little bit more. You go to the priest in charge of the time and say to him, I acknowledge this day before the Lord your God that I have entered the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to assign us. So, and the Kohen, he takes the basket from your hand and he places it near the altar. And then you make a declaration. Take it from there. So the declaration begins our Mio Vedavi. My fa- often translated, my father was a wandering Aramean, and relates in just a few short verses the story of the descent into Egypt and the exodus from Egypt and the arrival in the land. And so when the farmer presents his first fruits, he's acknowledging God's saving power as the fulfillment of his promise to the people that The point of the Exodus was not just to leave Egypt, but to enter the land that God swore to our ancestors. And this ritual is associated in the Bible with the holiday of Shavuot, the holiday of the first fruits. And we associate this with Pesach. And I just want to take you through something that's happened to speak about in my school this morning, that in this history that the farmer recites, he does not mention the Sinai experience. We could go through this entire history without any mention of the Torah being revealed at Sinai, which is quite stunning when we recall that for the rabbi, Shavuot is the holiday that's all about the Sinai experience. It's the Man Matan Torah Tenu. But here, the farmer is bringing physically the first fruits of the land to acknowledge that God delivers on his promises. We, living much long afterwards, associate this text with Pesach, because if we follow the traditional Seder and the traditional Haggadah, this is the heart of the Haggadah. This is our telling of the Exodus story. And what's suggestive to me is that this text points back to the Exodus from Egypt. It points forward to the future redemption, which we identify traditionally with the Messiah, but for the rabbis, it also suggests that redemption is in the everyday by the telling of the story, that what we're left with at the end of the day in exile is a story that has redemptive power that can redeem as much as sacred deeds used to redeem. So so I want to just um, go into it a little bit and ask, from the experience of the, the pilgrim, I want to I want to get into the to the mind of the pilgrim. And I want to I want to ask whether or not the pilgrim is aware of what he's saying. And and if this is about making the pilgrim aware of what he's saying, and what is it that we want that person to to think about? Um and and the purpose of having these kinds of rituals with a with a narrative associated to it. And I think this is very striking. We, we, we're we giving a lot of content to this. He's making a whole story. He's got a whole story of how he got there. So this is one of those passages, as mentioned in Mishnah Sota, that have to be said, if I remember correctly, in Hebrew. 
Mm -hmm. because of the phrase vanita vamarta that you which the rabbis identify with Hebrew and if it has to be said in Hebrew then the power at least in the rabbinic imagination is in the ritual not in the content but we tra translate vanita vamarta that you shall respond and say or you shall declaim it's an emphatic statement, I guess, is the best way to put it's, it in English. It's a formulaic statement. It's a, a for, yes, a formulaic statement. So it doesn't require our understanding because the ritual works by the proper recitation of the formula. So this is where where you know I want to just hone in on this because part of our own religious experience is that we want to understand what we say. You know, of course, prayer and of course liturgy has different components to it. We're, we're entering this whole season where we're going to be saying volumes and volumes of words where you know not everyone's going to be able to concentrate on everything, not everyone understands everything. And uh, at least you want some core things to understand. Well, like, where did you come from? What, who are you? What, what is it that you're doing here, Jeremy? This is this is really, I think, very very significant. First of all, it, uh, it is of course true. I'm, I'll put this in brackets here that um, that the incantatory power of a sacred language that for the vast majority of Jewish history, the very small percentage of people really understood Hebrew well, and we were praying in a, in a, an unfamiliar language that people got some of or they didn't get some of but the incantatory like the the mystical power of this language was strong and you can see it's only been about 50 or, or 60 years since vatican ii and the catholics started saying mass in the vernacular and and plenty of traditionalist catholics think that all oh, the mystery and the power got lost when they stopped doing the latin mass and i think that we those of us who are you know in davening in in very, very Hebrew-centric synagogues, when we find ourselves perhaps in a reform synagogue or a synagogue with a lot less Hebrew and a lot more English, it's like, what? No, you're, you're missing the, you're missing the uh, majestic, mysterious power of the sacred language. And that's a big thing. But, but I don't really think that in the Bible, that's what's going on, because the Bible is written in Hebrew for a Hebrew-speaking world. And the Bible is doing exactly what Elliot just said, which is, it is telling you that your personal experience of having enough food and your personal experience of work, you've been a farmer. You had you had first fruits, and that can be like first fruits, meaning it could mean you know apple apples and peaches, and it could also mean wheat and barley. Um, you worked hard on that. You have something to eat. You're going to feed your family, and you're going to experience that in gratitude. But it's not only man. This is wonderful agricultural bounty. We're doing okay. It is that you, the meaning of your life, not just the fact that you have food, but the meaning of your life is related to the fact that you are a member of this long people who has this long story, and it's about your suffering and the, the your own personal experience right now is related to ancestral suffering and a you know a, and a story that has a historical vector or the, the fancy you know religion word would be This is the this is the sacred story that gives your people. Gives your people a, a point. It's kind of a point in life. So let me ask this question, which is, we didn't rehearse this, but I'll ask it anyway, because as you speak, I think that here we are, we're entering a season where, you know, two and something weeks away of, it's it's really a, a, a modern pilgrimage on the scale, on the local scale. You have how many hundreds and maybe a, over a thousand people coming to your synagogue, I have several hundred people coming to my synagogue. Uh, they're 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 coming in a sense in a pilgrimage. Of course, I have you know a, a core community of of people who worship regularly who come to Shabbat and and make that a part of their lives. But we have certain orbits around those those the core community who who use and see this time as a pilgrimage time. So then the question is. What's the modern Arami Ovedavi? What's what's the narrative that that a pilgrim says when coming into the synagogue now? Is there such a thing? And should we compose one? Should we just try to riff on this, you know, you know, off the top of our heads? I, I think what the modern pilgrim would say is I am a displaced person. That at this time of year, I thought I knew where I was in the world, and suddenly I realized I have no place that I'm familiar with. 
And so I come to the place, the synagogue, looking for a grounding in the words and the music that I hear. And I would say that this will be one of those things of, of which in the recent you know, a couple of years, there have been so many uh, where Israeli Jews and American Jews or Israeli Jews and Jews in other parts of the world will feel differently. I mean, American Jews don't really feel like in exile, but we can have that thing that Barry just said. I'm, I'm, you know, out, I'm taken out of my normal course of life and pointed towards something else. I think that the I think that the there's some element of pilgrimage in a country where kibbutz galuyot, the gathering of all the different exiles to the ancestral homeland. I think that that probably probably at least some Israelis totally get this right. Um, we were wanderers. We were in Egypt. We were in Morocco and Poland and you know Hungary and whatever. And here we are in Eretz Yisrael. So it's not it's not about the pilgrimage to the worship site in Israel as much as it is the pilgrimage to and and it's certainly not about the pilgrimage to community because communities are 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 constructed in totally different ways there. But Barry, what you what you were saying, I mean, there's a certain resonance to that, which is, I it's an existential displacement, it's a personal displacement, it's a spiritual displacement, it's a spiritual homelessness. Is that is that what you're saying? I am, I am coming back to myself, my home, my spiritual home, my textual tradition. I'm living inside these things. Can you? I, what I would say is, I am not at ease, and I need to find some ease. And at this season, the place to go is to the synagogue. I think that's part of the power of the High Holy Days. I think one of the things that makes the Israeli experience different is that they're in the land that God promised our ancestors. They have a physical connection that those of us outside of the land of Israel simply don't have, even if they're not farmers. So the reason why I'm I'm kind of in meditating on what you said is because I'm trying to imagine, I'm trying to imagine the end of Yom Kippur which is the end of, of the first part of that of the season. Of course, we go all the way to Simchus Torah. And whether or not we accomplish at the Tekiya Gedola, at the end of Yom Kippur, Neila, that sense of ease that you're talking about. In other words, we, we are making a journey. We are coming into the house. We are inhabiting a space. Um, is... We're not always successful. I always, I was well, I, I think it depends on how we measure success. Because one of the things that intrigues me is why there are so many three-day-a-year Jews when they could be zero-day-a-year Jews. You know, they don't have to come at all, but they come those three days. My guess is, and I haven't really talked to a number of them, and certainly not in many years, is that they do feel a kind of ease at the end of Yom Kippur, so much so that they don't have to come back until next Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> but see, I actually feel that this passage of Armio Veravi, I, I feel it is an arrival passage. I feel it is an aff affirmation passage. Um, and and while I think that the American synagogue experience uh, probably ought to be somewhat. First of all, you, you asked this question: Do they feel easy at the end of Yom Kippur? Well, maybe we, if we're if we're fortunate, we can say they felt challenged, displaced over the ten days, and arrive at some place reintegrated, someplace good. That would be wonderful. Uh, if you could feel like if you could feel like the rituals that you help people go through, both ask them to do tshuva, ask them to make a change, ask them to be different, and then show them how, and then take some place where say, "Yeah, I am. I am different." That would be totally awesome. But I think that Arami Ovedavi in this passage, um, in Passover maybe, and in in Shavuot, um, is like you, yeah, dude, you arrived. This we are thriving. We are thriving like nobody's business. There's not the only thing that goes on in the parsha, of course, and the parsha overall is pretty dark. 
Let's uh, get to that in a second. I, I just can we just put the postscript on on the pilgrimage? You can read verse eleven first. The, the guy places the the basket, and we can't read this whole ceremony without without the the final verse. The samachta becholatov, and you shall enjoy together with the Levite and the stranger in your midst all the bounty that the Lord your God has bestowed upon you and your household. The samachta becholatov, asher natan lechadunai elohecha. So there's a there's a bit of a um translate. tingling uh sense there that you translate the verse, Elliot. I'm sorry, translate. translate the verse. All the bounty that the Lord your God has bestowed upon you and your household, you and you shall enjoy together with the Levite and the stranger in your midst. In other words, there is there is the component of joy. And so what I want to say is that the I may not feel at ease at the end of Yom Kippur, depending on what what happens during the whole season, and it's you know complicated where we all go spiritually, emotionally. But there is a certain joy. There is a certain joy. I think there's a certain joy when when we 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 hear the show for the first time. This year it'll be on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. There is a certain joy when people come together. There is a certain joy when we sing the familiar melodies. And it's there. It's there for it's on unex- it, it's hard to explain what that joy is about. Is it the joy of coming together? Is it the joy of connecting to something beyond ourselves? Is it the joy of inhabiting these stories and texts? Or is it simply the joy of, you know, we've had a good time with people that we love, family certainly have been together if families are lucky to be together. And um it can be a very, very satisfying time. So what I would suggest is that one of my favorite B2EM expressions is not the popular one, but my version of it, which is that sometimes familiarity breeds content. And I think what people respond to on the High Holy Days in a way that we don't always appreciate is the music. music. And this is tied with ritual without understanding because music is not necessarily understood the way other art forms is because we listen to it. And um, we can experience meaning without putting that meaning into words, which is very difficult to do with a poem or a a work of written literature. It's so fascinating that the holiday, the high holidays are the most musically rich of all of our holidays. And that, there's a reason for that. And the reason... Well, and I think what happens is you come into shul, you hear those melodies, which you probably heard the previous year. And in many cases, those years stretch back to your youth. Yeah. So they've accompanied you for your entire religious life, however you construe your religious life. Right. That um, this is the for many people at first, but it's also the last thing that they give up. Yeah. Because as religion peels away in the modern world, people still, many, come three days a year. And and not only that, but it's, if you enter the musical world of the holidays, the high holidays, you you realize there's just so much information in the music. There's just so much that's going on musically, um, just in melody, and, well, yeah. and I think what speaks to that is the melody for Kol Nidre, because yeah. let's face it, Kol Nidre as a, a religious text is, shall we say, wanting, um, not necessarily engaging, but the melody is wanting. Yes. And so yeah, the, but I want to... that's really true. Avinu Malkeinu, like the Jewish soul just knows Avinu Malkeinu. And it would be interesting to, to, to like wonder. I mean, I, I think. We, we we were talking before about the person before we started recording. We're talking about the person in my life who I don't actually know who's the most important to me, Bruce Springsteen, and he talked about his own his own <laughs> Catholicism. He says like I'm not the best Catholic, but I'm on the team, and and I feel that some of the times when people come to to shul on the high holidays, that's what they're saying. I'm not I'm not the best Jew, but I'm on the team. And I think people people want people want that, and the music is certainly a big part of, of what helps them feel part. that they're on the team. 
huge part because that's people connect through that people can, you know and and I, it's it I, we spend a lot of time in our heads you know talking about the text and talking about what these things mean but um i, I you know I, i'm thinking now you know on on long walks and bike rides you know about what to talk about and and it always goes back to the music. It always yeah. goes back to the music. I want to come back to the verse for a moment because right. the verse has the words "Bechol Hatov," all the good yeah. that God has bestowed upon you. You're supposed to enjoy. And so the question is, what exactly does that refer to when you bring the first fruits? Are we understanding that the first fruits are the entirety of the good at that moment, or do we understand the first fruits as pointing to a bountiful harvest? And I think that as, as religious Jews, we want to hold on to both, that we want the call to at first to be totally embracing for whatever we have at the moment, but we also want it to point to the future as well. And I think there's something about that in the high holidays too, because we can't really imagine Rosh Hashanah without Yom Kippur. Sure. The, you know, I think the one thing about the, um, the first fruits, the, the rabbinic literature assumes that you know first the first fruits we say this mishnah in the in the uh just i'm talking about two mishnah one of them which we say in the morning service there are certain things which have no fixed limits and you can't say like, how much what's the, what's the amount of first fruits there's no fixed limit it's not you know a certain percentage but you designate and, and here's another teaching in the in the mishnah and bikurim what did they do they would tie a ribbon around a given agricultural product like the, the 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 tree's first set of apples they would tie the ribbon around a given set of apples like you imagine like you're a farmer you're working and sometime in 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 like you know whatever in in late april or early may the apple starts to grow or whatever peach or whatever it is and you tie a ribbon on it like this loving it's like this little kiss that the farmer gives to this individual piece of fruit. produce, you know, literally what we would call an English fruit or vegetable or grain or something like that. And they come with great fanfare and they come with, with, um, uh, beasts of burden, like, you know, donkeys and cows and stuff like that coming up to Jerusalem for the pilgrimage and they're decked with flowers and there and the shofar and the trumpets are blowing this great, this great processional, um, it, it is it is future oriented because it's the first fruits, it's not the final fruits. That's going to come in in Sukkot, not Shavuot. But um, it, it it does seem like just such a vigorous celebration. Well, it's an act of self transcendence because when you tie your ribbon around that fruit, you're designating it for God, and you're recognizing that whatever you have in your field, not all of it belongs to you. And both gladly and graciously, you set aside for God what belongs to God. The Samachta also has a component of generosity. Um, that that it's it's a verb in which it seems that it can't be fulfilled unless there is something that is imparted to others, whether it's the emotion or whether it's an actual gift of generosity or some some content. So so we have this pilgrimage ritual we have another ritual which we're going to skip over and then of course the the, the parsha deals with the consequences of keeping or not keeping the covenant and goes into some territory that is um quite quite harsh um uh, and i'm I, you know after speaking about the um the pilgrimage and you know its relationship to contemporary jury and high holidays, etc. I'm wondering if we even want to talk about what happens if we don't do this. But but I'm going to kick it off um, because there's a lot of poetry. It it just so happens here's here's the irony of this. You know, these things are so terrible. These things are so terrible. But we say it so nicely. <laughs> <laughs> we we have such a way of of describing. Awful things. For example, chapter twenty-eight, verses, verse twenty-eight. Yakecha Adonai, b'shigaon, uve ivaron, uve timhon levav. The Lord will strike you 
with madness, blindness, and dismay. But in Hebrew, it's a rhyme. Shigaon, Ivaron, the Timon Levav. And I'm thinking like, okay, so here's the text. The text is, it's awful. But the subtext is, you know, we're going to make a rhyme out of this, which means- if you're going to suffer, you're going to at least- you're going to enjoy it. Enjoy it. Oh, my God. Well, just, I would say that the two, you know, the two best writers, I mean, aside from the Psalms, and some of which are great and some of which are not so great, but Yirmiyahu and Yeshayahu, Jeremiah and Isaiah, they're magnificent, magnificent writers. And Isaiah is mostly the writer of beautiful stuff to make you feel that there'll be, you know, children can play with snakes and nobody's going to get hurt and the lion, the leopard will lie down with the lamb. Yeah, I think it was Kissinger who said, when the leopard lies down with the lamb, you want to be the leopard. <laughs> <laughs> the leopard lies down with the lamb. Well, Woody Allen said, but the lamb doesn't get much sleep. <laughs> but as I said, this is Jeremiah. Like, death crawls in your window, you know, and, 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 People pass out on the streets from hunger and and better better to be slain by the sword than to die of famine. And this is this is like totally Jeremiah. He's he's just he's kicking it. But it does it so well. <laughs> oh, it's, it's it's amazing. It's amazing, like amazingly great writing. Yeah. Amazing. It's yeah. uh Pick a verse. it's King Lear, it's King Lear, or it's uh you know what, what? What? Who? Who else are the, the, the poets of like just I mean, let's, reading? Here, if I if I may prompt you to to talk about the the very last part of it, the last part of it, which is the you know the undoing. Go to verse sixty eight, twenty eight sixty eight. Yeah. yeah, this is the this is the last. In, in there, there, by the way, our, our, our listeners may know that there are the tochecha. That's what this is called. The tochecha, the rebuke, appears twice in the Torah, once at the very end of the book of Leviticus. And in Leviticus, like, ostensibly God is the speaker. And it's, it's bad, but it's shorter. And then it closes off and says, you know, but you'll make tshuva, and I'll take you back, and we'll start again. You know, we'll get lost, but we'll get found again. This one, Moshe is ostensibly the speaker, although, you know, the, 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 the space between Moshe and God in Deuteronomy is, is, is often not clear. Um, sometimes there's a first person speaker and it's clearly Moses, but, but sometimes he, like in the second paragraph of the Shema is an amazing thing. Moses is clearly the speaker. And yet he says things like, and if you do the mitzvah, I will give you rain. What do you mean? I will give you rain. Who, who are you? You're not giving rain. But um, here Moses is ostensibly the speaker and it's longer and it's darker. And, and you want it darker. Moses gives it to you darker and it doesn't close off with tshuva. It just says, you're, you're, you're going to suffer. So the, the very end, which is the undoing of the story of Aramio Veravi, Aramio Veravi, the, the farmer says, listen, my, you know, my wandering Aramean went down to Egypt, suffered, 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 but God heard and took us out. And then we were liberated and brought here. So the undoing of that is the close of the Tokicha, the final verse. God's going to send you back to Egypt in ships. I promised you you would never see that road again. I got bad news for you. You're going to be carried away in ships on that road again. And, you know, for an American who, who can think of the story of people being brought to this country on slave ships, that's, that's, the, that's what this evokes. Um, I promise you, you wouldn't be on that passage on slave ships. You, you're back on the slave ships. The Hitma Kartem, and you will be sold there in the market. Sham, there in the market. Lo Evecha, to your enemies. La Avadim Lishvachot, as male and female slaves. The Ein Kone, and nobody will even buy you. You will be so wretched that as a slave, you you won't, nobody even wants you to be their slave. You'll be so wretched. And that's the end of the Tochicha. So the if God in Leviticus says we can start again, the human lacking some of the divine grace and mercy, God, Moses has less rachamim than God, um, just says the story of Egypt is turned upside down and you're going to be the most wretched slave in Egypt. So it also 
it's worth noting that it undoes the miracle at the Sea of Reeds. Because when Israel left Egypt, they walked through the sea on dry land. And now they're going to be brought back against their will on boats. Okay, so so this is the theme again of displacement. <laughs> that, that these people are, so the potential of being displaced. So let's just try and tie it all together, which is you're saying that that we come to shul you know in a in a sense of displacement that that the the consequence of not fulfilling the covenant is a geographic displacement from the land which also includes the um the elimination of your freedom and um and and you're saying also that there's there's no hope there where is the hope at the end so I, I think the hope is in the idea of teshuva understood now as return. Yeah. That the way you undo being displaced is to find your place. And it's a place where we think we've been before, which is why we call it teshuva return as opposed to finding our way. Right? We're not looking for a place we've never been. We're looking for a place that we've we've been before and what i would say i think elliot is that it's an existential displacement and what it comes back to is things so often do is to isaac Luria, who had the great myth of the original exile where adam and eve are separated from god in the garden he understood not just as a historical event but a I guess we might say a meta-historical event. It's something that's within the fabric of the of the universe that's continually happening. And our task is, you know, to mix a metaphor to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Well, that's that's uh I mean, and, and so maybe Chuva is 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 the the replacing or the the reassembly of of all of the broken pieces. Yeah, I like replace. That's a good yes. word. But yeah. Replace. That's nice. Okay. Um, yeah. w- without without wanting to end on on that note, I mean, we we maybe just dip into the into the haftorah for two seconds because the the haftorah for this week actually talks about this on some level, which is um, the shalmu yemei avlech, the days of mourning shall be ended, um, in the sense that it talking about displacement, talking about exile, talking about all of the, the terrible things that can happen to a person, including, of course, loss. And the promise that, yeah, you'll go through that. You'll, get, you'll, you'll go through this extraordinary period of intensity and, those, and, that, and that too has its terminus. And you will, you will see that there's a new day after that. And I think that, there's, that, that does give tremendous hope. So there's an analog to so own. just to follow it in terms of the high holidays, which is why Yom Kippur is followed almost immediately I, by the holiday of joy, which is Sukkot. Yeah. Right. What makes Yom Kippur work for us, I think, is that we can enjoy Sukkot. Yes. And Sukkot provides a nice complement to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur in that sense. I, I would say that the um, you know, there's a, there's a story about the Baal Shem Tov. I actually just read a version of the story. It's, a, it's, it's, it's something that's about him, although in this, the version that I just read is that he goes to this town on, on Yom Kippur and the Chazan is like singing the Hashem Nu Bogadu in a happy melody. Um, and I suppose you could say that maybe that maybe there's something happy about that melody too, but the the Baal Shem Tov. I we have been guilty. We have we have betrayed you. We have stolen. We have spoken foolishly, etc. All the all the the short confessional, and um, the see in the story the Baal Shem Tov says, what, what, are you, "What are you doing with the happy melody?" And he says, "Let me tell you a story. It's like the king. The king has great stables, and the stables are full of manure, and somebody's job is to clean out the stables and to give the king." you know, a clean, a clean place. So I love saying the confessional in that story, 
because I'm cleaning out the king's, I'm cleaning out the king's stable, and I'm gonna give him something clean. So whatever, it's a little homespun story, but it's like I think that's kind of how Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, or Rosh Hashanah work. Because if you say to, if you if you say, and I and I, and I wonder about this about the three the three time a year Jews too, because if you say to to people, listen, I want you to come to shul on these most important days of the year. And I want you to be sure you know that you really are not very good. You're like really not. You're a terrible sinner and you're really quite guilty. And, you know, oddly enough, that might not work for everybody. But if you say to people, um, you totally have the moral agency to be the best version of yourself. And you have to take responsibilities for your many mistakes of which you always make them. You are, you are seriously wanting and seriously powerful enough to be better. So to me, I love circus also. Um, I love being outside. I love our, you know, the shaking the lulav and the halal and the joy and the celebration. And um, I I think that the the, the affirmation that Chuba is like this great big gigantic pat on the back. It's not, it's not really you stink. It is you you are responsible, and we totally think that you can be better. And with that, we totally think that this has been great. It's been great to, to be with each other, to be with you. Thank you for watching and listening. Um, and I think using this time to orient ourselves, everyone, to the, the weeks ahead. Um, we'll probably have a conversation similar to this next week on a beautiful Parsha that's coming up. In the meantime, I want to wish everyone a Shabbat Shalom and thank you for watching. And see you next week on the next edition of Parsha Talk. Bye-bye. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.